Deep in the forest, a sacred tree is growing. It has been there since the beginning. This tree is full of power. It draws spirits to it from the earth and sky. It is from this tree that the whole forest is created. It sustains the plants and the waters, the birds and insects, the animals. It is because of this tree that we are all here. I'm Satya Moses. I'm Lee Carter. And we are about to go on an incredible journey. And Well, thank you. My name is Robert Svoboda. And um, I am a native of the United States. I moved to India in 1974, attended the Ayurvedic College there, and uh, since 1980-ish have been traveling around the world, lecturing, writing books, etc., on Indi traditional Indian, classical Indian subjects in 1995. I met Robert and Minakshi Moses and their two-month-old son Satya. Um, and ever since then I have been meeting them in various places. So when um, I was in Brazil a couple of years ago and the opportunity came to um, proceed into the Amazon um, and to visit a tribe there, uh, I, cons I thought to myself that this might be an interesting opportunity for Satya, who um, likes to travel, to um, expose himself to a, an environment and a culture that is very different from anything that he has been exposed to so far. Uh, Robbie first talked to me about this trip over a year ago, I think, I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, but over a year, and he basically talked to me and he said, Satya, um, I know these people down in Brazil that I was with last year, uh, and I'm just wondering if you want to come down some other time, maybe next year. Now it's reality, and I've been friends with Lee for a really long time, and I had said, hey, this this awesome thing that I'm going on, and do you want to come with? Dude, bro, why are you not wearing sunglasses inside? Thank you. I'm Lee. I'm a chef. <laughs> um, all of my friends are really nice, except for one of them. Um, How do you enjoy school? How do I enjoy school? Well, my teachers will probably be watching this movie. <laughs> or some part of it. They also got me a glow stick for me to trade for sexual favors <laughs> in the Amazon. <laughs> three, eight, six, two. Uh, period. Seven, three, two, one. We're doing some uh, preparations for the trip with Dave Carter. I'm Dave. I'm a dad of one of the adventurers. Great. 
Um, not the one who's filming me, the other adventurer. Never go swimming, that's what I hear. No, you can go swimming, never pee in the water. <laughs> uh huh. Seriously. It's not good. Yeah, no, you don't want to pollute the water. Nobody. Uh, Does it attract? It attracts a spiny catfish, which is not good. Well, another worry in the water. I thought it was piranhas and that, that thing that sort of uh, it climbs into uh, parts of your body. That That's the candiru. That's why you don't pee. As long as that you don't attracts. pee, you're fine. I see. We were being yes, less committal about the details of... Do not pee. Don't get in the water, kid. Pee Just also. don't go in the water. I'm Robin. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert Moses, father of Satya. Just to think of a young man of 17 having, in this day and age, going deep into a Amazon jungle with tribal people in some kind of uh, tribal communal experience is pretty awesome. We're just headed down for our last weekend in the U.S. For our trip? Yes. This is also Lee's last weekend of being 17. Um, getting back on November 16th, which is his birthday, and it'll be 18, and he can buy, oh, cig shit up. buy cigarettes and get tattoos. And That's true. That is scarily true. Yeah, tomorrow we're taking, uh, we're driving down to Newark airport in New Jersey and then we're taking the plane from the Newark airport to Sao Paulo in Brazil um, which I actually found out is the biggest city in the Western Hemisphere or has the most people um, which is pretty crazy and then from Sao Paulo we're gonna take another plane all the way across Brazil to a city called Rio Branco and then from there uh, we take a car and then we take a boat uh, down the river and that takes us to the jungle. To the wild. Great movie. Here's Robbie Svoboda. Hi, I'm chewing. How oh, nice. I'm waving. Smiling, chewing, waving. This is a special I think that you should put most of the dialogue on the traveling scenes because I feel uncomfortable with this camera in front of me. He's already begun watching his movie. I'm still choosing. Um, you'll notice they have the Katy Perry concert movie. That's obviously close to the top of my list. So we're going to be in Sao Paulo in 11 hours. So hopefully I'll be able to sleep, but I doubt it.
So today is October 20th. Um, we, a few hours ago, we got off our flight here in Sao Paulo. And now we're, we're staying at the house of Eric Schultz, who is a friend of Robbie's. Hi, my name is Eric. Whoa. <laughs> It's okay, just keep going. Yes, yes. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm from Brazil. I work here to Ayurveda Yoga in many years. Uh, I have 34 years. Um, um. So, we are attending the Spring Festival. This is spring in Brazil, October-ish. Um, as Eric was telling us the other day, the Winter Festival is uh, kept private for tribe members only. But the Spring Festival, <clears throat> because spring represents new beginnings, um, and especially because the tribe or the leaders of the tribe are well aware of the necessity to interact in some way, hopefully in some positive and productive way with the outside world. Um, the Spring Festival is open to outsider, interested outsiders who are willing to come and uh, participate. Mm, my first time I talked from the people from the Acre State is in 2010. I talked from one lady, one pajé, one shaman's name is uh, Francisquinha. I stay here in São Paulo, she stay here in São Paulo. Yonawa have this, this, this festival, everybody go. I like very much um, this, uh, this contact to the tribe, you know? but the first time I have the contact direct to the tribe from Acre. The state of Acre is the westernmost state in all of Brazil. Though it was originally part of Bolivia, Many Brazilians moved there in the early 19th century to work in the rubber tapping business. Acre was taken by Brazil in 1903, but only became recognized as a state in 1962. Acre remains mostly covered in rainforest. In fact, there are still uncontacted native tribes living in the corners of the state. As part of this festival, there will be um, uh, singing and dancing. And there will be a refreshing of the relationship between the human and the environment by means of consumption of various plants. Here in Brazil, I don't know the name yet, but in Peru and uh, the Spanish parts of South America, this sometimes is referred to as a religion, though I don't think that native people would call it a religion in the sense that we call it. In the Spanish-speaking parts, it's called vegetalismo, or literally vegetalism. So a way of belief in, in which suggests that the plants and the spirits of the plants possess positive desire and motivation to assist humans to live healthier lives, better integrated lives, and to remove from themselves any kinds of imbalances, any kinds of diseases that might be in them. This is the 23rd of October. Uh, we are right now in Brasilia, capital of Brazil. We just flew in. Woke up at 4.15 this morning, and it's going to be a long day. Oh, is this a sweet shot?
day one in the village. Well, yesterday we had an eight hour boat ride to get here, which is a bumpy boat with a loud motor. Another thing, there's a language barrier. There's we, me, we, and Robbie speak English. Everyone else here speaks Portuguese, and then the Yawanawa people also speak their own language. So it's a bit of a language barrier that we're having to deal with. So I'm going to go to lunch, and, uh, I guess breakfast now, um, and I'll put away the mic, but I'll give you a little, I'll just film as I walk so you can see some of the village. Decades ago, uh, contact was made between the Yamanawa and the outside world. Uh, and apparently not too long after that, a uh, number of missionaries came into the area and started to tell the Yamanawa everything that they were doing wrong, introduced the concept of hell, which apparently had not existed in their culture until that time. Um, and soon, the culture was breaking down there came a point in the 1970s, apparently, where some of the upper echelon of the tribe decided that they had had enough of that, and they succeeded at expelling the missionaries from their territory. Um, and after that, they have been trying to redefine what it actually means to be a member of this tribe, to be a member of the Yawanawa. On the one hand, uh, an important purpose, or maybe the main purpose of the festival, was to, to, to get the Yawanawa back to feeling like they were a cultural unit, back to feeling like they were natives, that they do what they have always done. On the other hand, the festival has also become a method by which the Yawanawa can reach out to the outside world, can obtain some actual cash from the outside world, and the very fact that outsiders are being brought into the tribe to participate in the festival inevitably changes the festival, if by no other reason than by <clears throat> creating a, an awareness of being observed. Festivities are in full swing, as you can see. You know, the festival is great, and, but there is the aspect of, I mean, people like me filming things. I try not to get up close in people's faces, but some people with cameras just go right up and film things. And I feel like if I was in a position where it was like a festival that had been going on for me for a long, traditionally from many, many years, I think I'd feel kind of weird about having a camera shoved in my face while I was doing it. So I try to be um, subtle when I film things. <laughs> but I guess if you invite the outside world and that's documentation is part of it. I do indeed maintain that this is something that is quite um, uh, omnipresent in all societies. The question of, first of all, what constitutes a tradition, second, how traditions are created, third, how they are maintained, 
uh, how they're transferred from one generation to another, and finally, in what way tra can a tradition be altered? Uh, in what way is it possible to make an alteration to a tradition in such a way that it remains a tradition, but now with something new added to it? <laughs> Today, Satya and I oh, yeah. did a game, um, a game where, um, which involves hours of, or an hour of circling and chanting uh, under the bright tropical sun. That's where I got my blisters. We both got very burnt from, and um, beating each other with uh, banana banana branches. <laughs> It's like a whip. Um, we both bled from that. This hurts so much more than my sides. Yeah. Lift up your arm and the side there. I think it's in turn to the side. Uh, we're definitely going to have to pick all this crap out of it. Caraca! Painful. Painful? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Can't really think right now. <laughs> Luckily we didn't get deep cuts. We just got bloody scrapes. We've been participating in their games uh, and ceremonies and hanging out playing cards with them and things like that. <laughs> We got um, a family who we've been hanging out with um, goes to school in a nearby town and we have just got their Facebook accounts, so that's cool. Oh. In Brazil, coffee all day, every day. E de were were nita un shun 
伊得为得为得你在呀，我写给你吧，你当心。切克切克切克，你在呀，伊得为得为得，伊得为得为得你当心。伊得为得为得，伊得为得为得你当心，伊得为得为得你在呀，我写给你吧，你当心，写给写给写给你大呀，伊得为得为得。When we talk about something like the medicina, the madrecita, or as it is sometimes called, yahe, or the yawanawa call it uni, and it is most popularly known nowadays as ayahuasca, it provides an alteration in perception that permits one to look at things differently from the way in which one's awareness has, generally speaking, been calcified. It's natural for this to happen. When you're a child, you look at things with completely new and fresh eyes. The old saying, Zen mind, beginner's mind. The standard way of acculturizing people, however, is to expose them to certain repetitive experiences, teach them whether these experiences are desirable or undesirable in the context of the culture, and get that to become second nature to the person so they will behave like a good member of the culture, not disturb the apple cart, not rock the boat, and uh, not ask too many questions that might disturb the traditions that already existed. But inevitably, traditions become so fossilized that they have to be disturbed at some point. It's just like an earthquake. If stresses arise along a fault line, then at some point that stress has to be released. And so there are always questions of how these fault lines can be managed. Festivals are one way to manage these fault lines. And another way is to have the fault lines that exist within each one of us be managed by experiencing things from a different perspective, which is one thing that ayahuasca offers us the possibility of doing. The sun had set and people were gathered under the central pavilion. A shaman poured me a cup of brown liquid. It was incredibly bitter. I gagged when I swallowed. I wandered around, waiting for something to happen. I went to Zhuka's house and played cards for maybe half an hour. I walked back to the field and suddenly felt lightheaded. I lay down on the grass, closed my eyes, opened them, and then opened them again. I was living in a different world. I saw gods and trees and big insects in the sky. When I closed my eyes, blinking patterns filled my vision. The sound of the people chanting bounced off the sky as if I was inside a huge snow globe, and time stretched out forever. There is a question that exists now and has existed for probably as long as humans have been self-aware them, uh, at all, which is, if I perceive something that is not absolutely real in the physical world, that I can't grab hold of or um, interact with in some uh, physical way, is that, is that thing actually real or is it not real? 
if a person is galvanized to action by something that actually does not exist, do we say that that thing does not exist, or we do we say that it does? If it does not exist in the real world, but still it is able to cause people to do things, if something like communism enabled communists to murder hundreds of millions of people, do we regard communism as being real or unreal? These are matters for philosophers. What is important to individuals is to be able to determine I think, at least, what is real for themselves. I left my physical body and delved deep inside myself, awakening a beast that took on the form of a tiger. I could feel the pulse of the forest and lost the ability to connect with all humans other than Satya, Eric, and Ravi. I lost all sense of self and my logical brain ceased to control my actions. I remember walking down a wooded path listening to the forest, slowly slinking along, all my muscles working in perfect harmony. My vision had changed. I wasn't hallucinating. I was seeing the world through a different lens. The forest seemed smoother, more welcoming, and my vision was sharper. I was truly primal. In many traditional cultures, and by traditional cultures I mean cultures that are still living in the, con in, in, in the context of a relatively intact environment. There is, a con there is a disease category that is shared by several of them that we can more or less refer to as soul loss. Sometimes they say that when you listen too much to the jungle, part of who you are, part of your spirit, goes out and gets trapped mm -hmm. in that environment of the jungle. There's all kinds of cues that are coming from the natural environment all the time. And if, as I believe, the natural environment is itself an organism, then there is a relationship that always has to exist between the individual and that external organism. If it's a healthy relationship, then there will be a partnership between the two to work for forward for the benefit of both. If there is an adversarial relationship, then the uh, individual be, will be trying to conquer the environment, and the environment, in return, will try to conquer the individual. Sometimes it happens that when the individual is not paying attention to the relationship, sometimes the external environment, which is, after all, much bigger externally than the individual, sometimes that may encroach on the individual, and sometimes it may cause the individual to start perceiving things in a different way. So this concept of... Um, of, of soul loss or spirit loss is something that happens when a person is not properly established in himself or herself. Today is October the 31st. Festival ended yesterday and, and we might actually be heading home sooner than we'd expected because apparently now someone's telling us that we can't stay past the second. The group have this, this organized for one week more in the tribe from go to the old village, the sacred village, talk for pages, caciques, everything. But it's not. This is not for, for possible. One day the people talk is it's not possible. But the federal policeman is staying in the tribe. I explain only only the contexts. Uh, having Congress, Congress, Brazilian Congress, many uh, political guys from Protestant, Catholic and different uh, religions. But these people um, don't like ayahuasca, don't like uh, traditional religions from Brazil or different religions from Africa, Hinduism, and blah, 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 more, more, more. And three or four years, I don't remember exact date, these guys uh, try put one lawyer, lawyer now, is this one, uh, Lawyer? No, no, put one uh, law Law in, Bra in Brazil. This is uh, the prohibit ayahuasca in Brazil. After this, it's not, not complete this, thank you Godness, but, but the guys now have the policemen many times go to this place, look at this, is not have drugs together to, to ayahuasca, but ayahuasca now in Brazil only is possible use for religion purpose. 
have drugs from uh, marijuana, no cannabis or cocaine, you know, different together. The police federation, federal police, police go and close the pl the place. Good people for the jail, whatever. La, la, la. Maybe for this the people go, but n nobody know exactly for what have policemen in the tribe. Last day in the village today. This is uh, last full day. This is October. No. This is November 1st. It's really hot right now, as it always is at this time in the afternoon. And I'm usually lying in Eric's hammock, enjoying the shade. And we'll be getting, tomorrow we'll be getting on the canoe, and I hope it rains before then, otherwise we'll have to carry him in the canoe half the way. So helpful whenever we require help. <laughs> My bonds with the Yawanawa people grew quickly, and although I couldn't speak the same language, I feel like I've developed lifelong friends, and I hope to go back. Okay, this is November 3rd. We're in Rio Branco, again, staying in a hotel. We just got out of the jungle yesterday. Interesting thing just happened. We were looking, we were trying to find songs that we heard at the village on YouTube, and we saw a video from, I'm not sure, maybe it was 2008. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. Maybe it was from 2008. We're not sure exactly. It was after 2006, but a little while ago, where uh, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, obviously a famous actor, um, went to visit the Yawanawa for a TV documentary. And at the time that he visited them, their chief was not uh, Bira, who was the chief when we were there, and the guy that we talked to, but this other guy, Tashka. Um, so there's an interesting story there. We've discovered that the very fact that there is a Yawanawa festival at all uh, is uh, substantially due to a previous chief uh, whose name is uh, Tashka. Tashka lived for several years in Taos, New Mexico, and came to get to know the people of the Taos Pueblo, other Pueblo Indians, the Diné or Navajo, and experienced the expression of the Puebloan cultures in festivals that they were sharing with non-natives and decided that it's quite possible that it would be beneficial for the Yawanawa to have such a festival. So right now we're still in Rio Branco and um, we were just at lunch mainly with some guys from the trip and one of them apparently is a friend of um, the Tashka, who is the chief from the video. So right now we're actually gonna go get a chance to, we're doing a serious video here. <laughs> right now we're actually gonna go get a chance to talk to him. Um, so that's really exciting. I used to work for five years in the United States. And there I was working with environmental and indigenous movement. Uh, I back in 2001. When I back to my people, I saw a lot of sadness. People was not into the tradition. People was not into the spirituality, and the people was feeling so horrible. They feel so weak. We say, let's do 
first a big evaluation. Who was the Yawanawa before the contact? How we are right now? And who we want to be in the future? And this kind of question we did, and we listened from the elders that the Yawanawa spirit never died. They were just holding the heart. And I, I say, let's express that. Let's like show to the new generation how, who we are. The, the main idea was not become a big carnival. The idea is to strengthen the Yawanawa language, to strengthen the culture for, for the communities. Uh, and I, I hope that, uh, and this will make me sad if it become a, a, a big carnival. Because this, we cannot play with the cigarette. We can sell anything, but we cannot sell what is secret. We cannot touch, we cannot step in the secret. <laughs> actually is going on in the society of the of the tribes people in the politics of the tribe is something that of course we were there for too short a period to actually uh, comprehend but it certainly seems that there is a good amount of discussion going on of dialogue of debate involving uh, the various questions that um, became very evident while we were there the questions of what is tradition, uh, is the tradition being preserved, are new traditions being created, is there still a culture, a Yawanawan culture that can be defined and further developed? What can we do to clarify our awareness of the nature of tradition and innovation? Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful host. And you do speak very good English. No. <laughs> you do. You try more times. Maybe the, maybe 2014 I talk more better English. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tatia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and what, the, I mean, oh. the part of what I liked the best was thought about doing it, continued thinking, planned it out, and did it. And survived. Most important. During our stay, the nine days that we stayed out with the Yawanawa, we had plenty of opportunity to see just how the outer world is making an impact on them from the fact that many of the children are attending school outside uh, of the village uh, to the fact that there are many people um, coming in from the outside uh, to participate in um, uh, various activities of the tribe. Here is a very great um, juxtaposition of a culture that is attempting to maintain its traditions even while its traditions are being changed by influences from the outside and the state in which it, uh, that culture exists, the, the, the culture of that state is changing rapidly. So what does it mean to be an Akhayana? And what does it mean to be a Yamanawa? And what does it mean to be a Brasileiro? All of these are questions that can't necessarily be answered per se. They're things that can be evaluated probably better in hindsight than in foresight because they are things that are undergoing an ongoing dynamic transformation. This is, is, is the way where we come from, where we're going from. We can share a lot of things, but other things we cannot share because we just belong to the Yawanawa world. And also, people are welcome to come. People that have a continuous, who are indigenous people? What is the, the tradition they need to teach? So here we are, back in snowy, cold New England. We've been back for a couple months. What's one of the things from Brazil that you like really want to keep? When I took the ayahuasca, it was like the part of me that I'd known for my whole life was shut down and a deeper part of me that I'd never met before kind of got awakened. He was a primal animal. 
it's interesting the societal difference between people who are connected with that other part of them throughout their whole lives and Western civilization where really some people are never never even know that part of them exists. When you experience something completely outside of your normal life, it can be difficult to process it when you return. Now that I've gone back to my normal life, growing up a teenager in America, it's sometimes weird to think that I was even with the Yawanao in Brazil. Yet I know that the journey I went on, down the river, and into the center of myself and the world, is one I will never forget. Oh, <laughs> 